Ryan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Between the year 325 and 381, titanic shifts occurred that changed Christianity forever. Rather than ending conflict and ushering in a golden era of lasting peace, Constantine's Council of Nicaea ignited a theological civil war within Christianity that raged for six more decades. In today's episode, you'll learn about the struggle over Christology that eventually ended with the Emperor Theodosius endorsing the Trinitarian Creed of Constantinople in 381. Rather than sugarcoating this tumultuous period, my hope is to relentlessly tell the truth in hopes that you can draw your own conclusions. Here now is episode 495, Early Church History Part 13, Trinity Controversy in the 4th Century. Last time we looked at the beginning of of the controversy. We started with Alexander and Alexandria and Arius, and Alexander was propounding the idea of that the Son was eternal. And Arius said, this is not what we have been taught. This is not what we believe. The Son was begotten. That's biblical. There's no scripture that says the Son is eternal, but there is a scripture that says several, that that he's begotten. And so Arius reasoned that if he's begotten, he has a beginning. And if he has a beginning, there was a time when he didn't exist. And ultimately, Alexander said, well, I'm the bishop, so you're excommunicated. So it goes sometimes in life, right? Well, the emperor Constantine eventually got involved and tried to bring peace. That didn't really work out. We eventually end up with the Council of Nicaea, which is where we're going to start today, with the Council of Nicaea. But before we get to that, I want to make, I want to obviate a prejudice of mine. I believe, as I just stated, that Arius was the conservative in the controversy and that it's inappropriate to call the battle over Christology, your beliefs about Christ, the battle on Christology in the fourth century. I think it's inappropriate to call it the Arian controversy. Arius was already 70 years old at the Council of Nicaea. He wasn't going to wage much of a controversy, okay? Most of the people that agreed with his beliefs did not think he was their leader or self-identify as Arians. So I have this really sweet quote by Vladimir Latinovich, who wrote an article called Arius Conservativus. And he says, Arius himself was not an innovator, but rather a conservative, traditionalist, and that as such, in contrast to Alexander and Athanasius, who are identified as innovators, He belonged to the older Alexandrian theological tradition. Also, so this is, that's a bona fide scholar at a legitimate Oxford patristics conference who said that, okay? Also, the foremost expert of the last century on Arius, uh, Anglican by the name of Rowan Williams, said, Arianism, and he puts it in quotes, as a coherent system founded by a single great figure and sustained by his disciples is a fantasy based on the polemic of Nicene writers, above all Athanasius, quote-unquote Arians, thought of themselves, naturally enough, as Catholics, as mainstream Christians, and regarded Athanasius and his allies as isolated extremists. So I think it's important to start with this, to say, look, there was no clear winner when the battle started. And it would take many years to figure out who was going to win, and there weren't just two sides either. There were several sides. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about the Council of Nicaea, which occurred from May to August in 325. The Emperor Constantine uh, had suggested a couple of other options, but he settled on Nicaea, which was his summer palace residence on a beautiful lake where he invited hundreds and hundreds of bishops to attend, paid their expense to get there. And all in all, about 250, somewhere between 250 and 300 bishops attended, only five from the West. So 245 bishops, give or take, from the East and only five from the West. So that's not ecumenical. I know 
later historians look back at Nicaea 1 and say, well, the council of 325 AD was the first ecumenical council. It wasn't ecumenical. Ecumenical means global. It didn't have representatives from the West in any kind of numbers that would be recognizable as fair. It was an Eastern problem. And it's interesting to think, too, these are the very people who have been brutally persecuted from the year 303 to 313. Now we're in the year 325. So these people, just a dozen years earlier, remember or have marks on their bodies from the persecution. Richard Rubenstein writes, A good many of them bore the scars of past persecutions, eye patches covering lost eyes, limps produced by severed hamstrings or Achilles tendons, backs deformed by hard labor in Phoenician mines. So these are people, I think our term today would be, that have PTSD. You know, they're, they're traumatized people, not all of them, but many of them, either themselves or people they love and know, have suffered or died. And now they're coming to the very place where the Roman emperor is. Of course, now it's Constantine, and he, he's favoring Christianity. But you've got to think that there's a little bit of nervousness, anxiety, that the emperor before this guy slaughtered us left and right for 10 years. So, like, let's just be careful at this thing. <laughs> I'm sure there was some of that. Of course, Arius, being that he was only an elder, was not allowed to partake or speak during the event itself. And it was very difficult for them to agree. Do they all think Alexander's right with this teaching that the Son is eternal? How does that square with him being begotten? It's a really difficult philosophical question. And there were lots of bishops on different sides. Constantine himself, the emperor, non-Christian emperor, he's favored Christianity, but he's not yet a Christian himself, he suggests the word homoousios. Homoousios is translated of the same substance. He, tra- he suggests this word, and where he got that word from is a whole big question in itself. And if you're interested in studying that, I recommend Keegan Chandler's book, Constantine of the Divine Mind, where he gets into the possible background of where Constantine was coming from as a pagan monotheist, not thinking as necessarily, certainly not biblical, but even as a Christian in light of this word. So anyhow, the the emperor suggests this word, homoousios, to describe the relationship between the father and the son, that they are of the same being or of the same substance. It's really the participle of emi, if you know Greek. So it's, it's really literally the word being. Uh, but usually we translate it as essence or substance. Now, Constantine suggests this word. Nobody opposes him, so far as we know. Even though this very word had been condemned multiple times by previous Christians because it sounded very Sibelian. And Sibelius taught that the father and the son were the same person. Exactly the same, but different aspects of the one God, if you will, or different modes. And so the word homoousios was associated with his heresy. This is a no-go word. Paul of Samosata, as we'll see next time. Uh, Paul of Samosata was associated with the word homoousios, and he also had been condemned. So this word was like bad, bad, bad. It's like, don't touch this word. The emperor comes in with it, and everyone's like, well, I guess we could work with that. You know, so it ends up kind of winning the day. And they adopted the following creed. This is the Nicene Creed, the Creed of Nicaea, which is a city in the year 325. It says, We believe in one God, the Father, Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, only begotten, that is, from the essence of the Father. So uh, this word right here, essence, is the Greek word usia. Usia is the word for being, substance, essence, right? So it's the idea that Jesus is, or not Jesus, but the Son, before he became Jesus. The Son is begotten from the essence of the Father. God from God, light from light, very God from very God, begotten, not made. So that's interesting, right? So it's making a distinction between those two things. One in essence with the Father, this right here, that is the Greek word homoousios, one is translated in English, one in essence. That's what this word means. This word is really important for you to, to understand because this dominates the whole controversy for the next 60 years. Uh, one in essence with the Father by whom all things were made, both things in heaven and things on earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down and was made flesh, 
was made man, suffered and rose again the third day, ascended into heaven, and cometh to judge the quick and the dead, and in the Holy Ghost. So that's the whole creed there. I don't think I had any ellipsis or dot, 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 right? I mean, that's, that's the whole creed. And then attached to the creed are these anathemas. Anathemas are curses. These are what you say against your opponents. And those who say, the first one, anathema number one, and those who say, once he was not, and before his generation he was not, and he came to be from nothing, or those who pretend that the Son of God is of other subsistence or essence, or created, or alterable, or mutable, the Catholic Church anathematizes, puts under a, a curse. Now, this actual creed here can be interpreted in different ways. In fact, there was a bishop present at the Council of Nicaea named Eusebius of Caesarea, who himself had suggested his baptismal creed of his church as a starting place for the creed, and then Constantine inserted this really controversial theological term. What Eusebius did is he wrote a letter home because he knew that people were going to hear what happened, and said, this is how we're going to read this creed. This is how we're going to interpret it. And, and Eusebius himself was a non-Trinitarian who believed that the Father was greater than the Son. So he was able to read this in a way that fit with that theology. Notice that there's nothing about person. There's no threeness here. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, they just say, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. Like, that's all they have to say about the Holy Spirit. You know, not not very exciting about the the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit there. The word Trinity doesn't occur here. At best, this is binitarian, but as I already told you, people can interpret it multiple different ways. And rather than putting out the fire of the controversy, as Constantine had hoped, this lit the match that resulted in a series of ongoing explosions that tore the church apart over the next decades. It's a very divisive, from a historical point of view, this is one of the most divisive creeds of all time. Between the years 325 and 381, we have 56 years there. Or if you want to count from the beginning of the issue, which was 318, it's 63 years. All the way up to the year 381, this controversy rages. It's spread to all levels of society. We have this really interesting quote by Gregory of Nyssa. He says, For the whole city, Constantinople, has been filled with such as these, the alleys, the marketplaces, the streets, the apartments, the sellers of garments, money changers, those who are selling cooked food. If you may ask for change, one philosophizes to you concerning a begotten and unbegotten. And if you might inquire concerning the cost of bread, one answers, the Father is greater and the Son is in subjection. And if you might ask, is the bath prepared? One says, the sun is not separated from nothing. (laughs) So in the streets, in the alleyways, in the marketplaces, where you go to buy your food and just live life in in the big city, people are talking about this. This was a discussed theological issue in the empire, the Roman Empire, for a long time. And everyone had an opinion. It wasn't, theology wasn't yet, the purview of the professionals. It wasn't secluded away in the you know, manuscript line offices of the experts. You know, it, was, it was in the streets. Everyone was talking about it. Hansen summarizes, this is RPC Hansen, he summarizes the whole controversy like this. He says, the supporters of this Nicene view wanted their readers to think that orthodoxy on the subject under discussion had always existed and that the period was simply a story of the defense of that orthodoxy against heresy and error. So we have two important words here. We have the word orthodoxy and the word heresy. Orthodoxy means right opinion. If you look at a subject, basically whatever you think is the orthodox view, and everyone who disagrees with you is a heretic or believing in a heresy. The Nicenes, the people who supported the Creed of Nicaea that I just read to you, this homoousios, and the people who believe in homoousios are called homoousians. And they're saying, oh, look, we always believe this. This is just what the church always taught. 
And so RPC Hansen, after writing this masterful treatment of the subject, hundreds and hundreds of pages long, he says, actually this is in its introduction, he says, they wanted you to think that, but it ought to be obvious that this could not possibly have been the case. If the solution to the problem was clear from the start, why did the controversy last 60 years? Why did it involve several successive Roman emperors and entail the holding of at least 20 councils, both sides, indeed all sides, for there were more than two appealed confidently to tradition to support them. With the exception of Athanasius, virtually every theologian, East and West, accepted some form of subordinationism, at least up to the year 355. Subordinationism might indeed, until the denouement of the controversy, have been described as accepted orthodoxy. And in this case, orthodoxy means the accepted mainstream view on the topic. So there were three main parties in the battle. And it's important for you to keep these straight because they, they're weird words. And I don't know what I could do about that. But the first one are the homoousians or Nicenes. These are equivalent terms, people that favor the homoousios word in Nicaea. They believe the Father and the Son are of the same essence, same substance. And the representative of them is Athanasius. Then you have the Anomians or Arians, and a representative of them is Eunomius. The Anomians, that word means not like. So they believe that the Son is not like the Father. He's not, his substance, his stuff, his origin, is not of the same substance as the Father. It's of a different substance as the Father. Another term for it is heterousians. I'm not going to burden you with that when I give you enough already. But it means other being. He's an other being. Now, all three of these parties believe in the preexistence of the Son of God before the human Jesus. Okay? And what they're differing on is how did he come into being as a preexistent individual? And then you have the Homoians. The Homoians are also called semi Arians. And a representative of them is a man named Acacius. Homoians means like. So that the son is of like substance to the father. So you can see that on the one side you have the same substance, that's homoousians. And then you have the anomians, not like. So this is the same substance, this is a different substance. And then this third category here is the middle position. He's of a similar substance of the Father. So this is the balanced middle view from, at least that's what they would argue. All right, so let's talk about, I'm going to go through all three of these. Let's look at the Homoousians first, or the Nicenes, or you could call them Athanasians, people that agree with Athanasius. Athanasius is extremely important for this, so I'm just going to say a couple of things about him. He lived from 296 to 373. He took over for Alexander after Alexander died. Alexander actually dies right after the Council of Nicaea in 326. So the council is in 325. Then in 328, Athanasius takes over as the bishop of Alexandria. And however strong you thought Alexander was, Athanasius had a double portion. Uh, he was twice as strong. He was a very, very strong character. He led the charge for the Nicene faction. Charles Freeman wrote in his book, A.D. 381, Athanasius was not an intellectual. He does not seem to have experienced a classical education. His thought is not wide-ranging or considered in its use of philosophical distinctions and concepts, is the verdict of David Brockey. Charles Freeman also says that Athanasius preferred to root his theology specifically in the Scriptures although he was also a somewhat obsessive defender of homoousios, even though the word is unscriptural. That's a really apt description of Athanasius. On the one hand, he's a Bible guy. He knows the book. He's going to proof text you. He's going to argue with you using the Bible. He's not philosophically sophisticated. But on the other hand, He's got this philosophical word that he just loves, and he's going to defend to his dying breath, no matter if anyone else agrees with him or not. 
And so he's got both of these things sort of like this conservative, traditional, but then also this innovation. That word is an innovation. That is not a traditional Christian word to describe the father and the son's relationship. He relentlessly fought to force others to accept the Nicene Creed. He was there at Nicaea. He was young, and he had not taken over yet, but he was there. And so from his writings, you get a sense of his temperament. This is one of his writings here. He wrote four discourses against the Arians. This is from the third one. He says, But as it seems, a heretic is a wicked thing in truth. And in every respect, his heart is depraved and irreligious. He's talking about his brothers in Christ who just happen to disagree with... I mean, they all believe in the pre-existence of Christ. They just disagree with like how he, came, he got his start or if he ever had a start. These, this, these are his bitter enemies that he's arguing with. They, just, they only agree on 99%. Anyhow, he goes on, For behold, though convicted on all points as the hydra of Gentile fable, when its former serpents were destroyed, gave birth to fresh ones, contending against the slayer of the old by the production of new, so also they, hostile and hateful to God as hydras, losing their life in the objections which they advance, invent for themselves other questions, Judaic and foolish, and new expedients, as if truth were their enemy." thereby to show the rather that they are Christ's opponents in all things. Really, really over-the-top rhetoric here. But it wasn't just his words that Athanasius used to defeat his enemies. He persecuted Christians he disagreed with, and he had the means to do that. There were multiple councils called against Athanasius specifically for his behavior. Multiple councils found him guilty and excommunicated him. In fact, in the Search for the Christian Doctrine of God, the blue book by R.P.C. Hansen, Hansen, he has a whole chapter called The Behavior of Athanasius. And there's enough material there to fill a whole chapter in this very learned book about it. And he documents Athanasius lying, slandering, misrepresenting, omitting, changing the words of others. So that's like fighting dirty with your pen, basically. And then he says that Athanasius employed thugs to intimidate his enemies. So that's old school gangster stuff right there. And he's supposed to be a bishop in a prestigious position, one of the five most important churches in the entire Mediterranean world, and he's using gangster tactics. Actually, R.P.C. Hansen, who's kind of like a stuffy British author, he actually uses the word gangsterism of Athanasius, which is hysterical. He was so bad that for 20 years, from 335 onward, Eastern bishops would not talk to him at all. They just were not going to talk to Athanasius. A lot of this came back to the time that he sent an agent to beat up a presbyter who he disagreed with. And you know, when he sent his thugs there, they broke the altar and they smashed the communion chalice and they beat this guy up, a guy named Ischyrus. When confronted, when Athanasius was confronted, why did you do this? This is ungodly behavior. His response was, Iscaris is not a real presbyter because his ordination is invalid. He didn't deny beating him up. (laughs) He was exiled repeatedly. Out of his 45 years as a bishop, he spent 15 of it in exile outside of his bishopric in Alexandria. And he is known even to this day as Athanasius Contramundum, which means Athanasius against the world. Even though he carried on such an ungodly manner, he's known today not only as a Christian, but he's considered as a saint by both Catholic and Orthodox churches, but not only as a saint. He's a top-level saint. He's considered a doctor of the church, the most prestigious honor that somebody could receive. He's venerated to this day and considered to be God's warrior in a time of trouble. All right, on to the next one. I wouldn't even want to have lunch with Athanasius, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm being honest with you. I think he'd turn it into something, something of a fight. He's a true heresy hunter. All right, then we have the Anomians. These are Arians uh, represented by Eunomius. These are people who are going to say that the Father and the Son are different than each other. The Father created the Son, and, and, but you know, as the conflict wages on, they kind of soften their rhetoric a little bit. 
And we get this creed of Sirmium in the year 357, also called the Anomian Creed, which I can read to you now. It says, It is evident that it, there is one God Almighty. So this is 25, 27 years after Nicaea. This is the, when this creed is coming out. It is evident that there is one God Almighty and Father, as is believed throughout the whole world, and His only Son, Jesus Christ, the Lord our Savior, begotten of the Father Himself before the ages. But it cannot and ought not to be preached that there are two gods. But since some or many persons were disturbed by questions concerning substance, called in Greek usia, that is, to make it understood more exactly, homoousion, or what is called homoousion. So homoousion is the same substance. Homoousion, that extra I there, means of similar substance. So the creed is saying, because there's confusion over this, there ought to be no mention of this at all. Let's just get rid of it, guys. Nor ought anyone to preach it for the reason and consideration that it is not contained in the divine scriptures, and that it is above man's understanding. Nor can any man declare the birth of the Son, of whom it is written, Who shall declare his generation? For it is plain that only the Father knows how he begat the Son, and the Son how he was begotten of the Father. There is no question that the Father is greater. How's that for <laughs> subordinationism? Hello. No one can doubt that the Father is greater than the Son in honor, dignity, splendor, majesty, and in the very great name of Father, the Son himself testifying, He that sent me is greater than I. And no one is ignorant that it is the Catholic doctrine that there are two persons of Father and Son, that the Father is greater and that the Son is subordinated to Him, that the Father has no beginning and is invisible, immortal, and impassable, but that the Son has been begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light. Isn't that incredible? If this group had won the day, the Catholic doctrine would have been this rather than the, as we'll see later on, the Trinity idea. We're not really at the Trinity idea yet. We're still looking at the binity, the Father and the Son. We'll, we'll come to the Spirit in a little bit here. All right, then you had the Homoians or Semi-Arians, and they had a, a big council in Constantinople. Wouldn't you believe it? At the capital of the empire, it was subordinationist. It was not Nicene. It was not Homoousion. It was Homoian. But this is a creed from the capital city of Constantinople in the year 360. So moving on in time a little bit. And it says, We believe in one God, Father Almighty, from whom are all things, and in the only begotten Son of God, begotten from God before all ages, before every beginning, by whom all things were made, visible and invisible, begotten as only begotten, only from the Father, only God from God, like to the Father that begat Him according to the Scriptures, whose origin no one knows, except the Father alone who begat Him. But the name of essence, that's the word usia, which was set down by the fathers in simplicity and being unknown by the people, caused offense because the Scriptures do not contain it. It has seemed good to abolish and for the future to make no mention of it at all. Since the divine Scriptures have made no mention of the essence of the Father and of the Son, for neither ought subsistence to be named concerning Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but we say that the Son is like the Father. There it is again. The Son is like the Father. And as the divine Scriptures say and teach, and all the heresies, both those which have been already condemned and whatever are of modern date, being contrary to this published statement, be they anathema. Everybody's so confident. Isn't that incredible? Like, whichever party you're in, you're just like, yeah, we're right. They all claim to be the Catholic Church, too, which is fascinating. Then we had council mania. I mean, just like council after council, before this, during this, after this one in 360. And if you want to know more about all the councils, I recommend this website. It's called fourthcentury.com. What a clever name. Just kidding. It's not clever at all. It's very descriptive, though. fourthcentury.com. And it will list out for you all these councils. You can click on them and read English translations of the different creeds. That There, there are many different creeds that came out during this whole period. Many of these councils found in favor of subordinationism over against the co-equality idea. Many also favored Nicaea. It was back and forth, back and forth. In the capital, though, it was solidly subordinationist in Constantinople itself. 
Bishops were excommunicating each other left and right. As an older man, Gregory of Nazianzus, who actually was on the winning side of the whole thing, this is what he said about councils. He said, my inclination is to avoid all assemblies of bishops. <laughs> because I have never seen any council come to a good end, nor turn out to be a solution of evils. On the contrary, it usually increases them. You always find their love of contention and love of power. And while sitting in judgment on others, a man might well be convicted of ill-doing himself long before he should put down the ill-doings of his opponents. Uh, now this is a man who's been to a lot of councils, and he had already been to the, the great council that later historians will look back on and say, well, that's the, that's the winning council, the Council of 381. Uh, he'd already been to that too. And he still has this sour taste in his mouth that like councils are pointless. So as you can imagine, some emperors favored one side and then another. Even Constantine himself initially kicked Arius out of the church after the Council of Nicaea in 325. Later on, he changed his mind and he brought Arius back into the church. Then the next emperor, Constantine the II, supported once again, Nicaea. And then the one after him, Constantius, supported the subordinationists. And it went back and forth. And then there was a pagan emperor named Julian. And he didn't support really any Christians. <laughs> he wanted to kill Christianity. And then we got back to Christian emperors again. And it just went back and forth until Theodosius supported the Homoousians. All right, let me just tell you a little bit about the three Cappadocians because they do figure rather large in the second half of the 4th century. And these are uh, men named Basil of Caesarea, who lived from 330 to 379, Gregory of Nyssa, lived from 335 to 395, and Gregory of Nazianzus, who lived from 329 to 390. Gregory of Nazianzus in particular is the guy that was complaining about the councils a minute ago. First, when he first got to Constantinople, the big cathedral in the city was subordinationist. It was a Homoian uh, bishop there. So he didn't have any place to meet as an Iseen, as a Homoousian. Uh, so he had to carry on meetings at a wealthy person's villa. So that's, that's how weak Nicaea was at Constantinople in the second half of the 4th century. And so he's meeting there while the big church is subordinationist. But uh, the big thing that these Cappadocians, these three guys did, is they did a lot of theological work on the Holy Spirit. And they're really the ones that developed this idea that the Holy Spirit is of equal worship and honor along with the Father and the Son. So that's a Cappadocian idea. Cappadocia is a region in Turkey, but like these guys were from there, so we just call them the three Cappadocians. But ba Basil, Gregory, and Gregory really did a lot of work on the Holy Spirit. In one place, Gregory of Nazianzus says, But of the wise men amongst ourselves, some ha have conceived of him, when he says him here, he means the Spirit, as an activity, some as a creature, some as God, and some have been uncertain. So those are the kind of options that you had. In the 4th century, second half, some people are saying the Holy Spirit is an activity. Some say, that, well, no, it's a creature. And others are like, oh, no, it's just a way of talking about God. And then others are saying, well, we don't know what it means. And he goes on to say, which to call him, out of reverence for Scripture, they say, as though it did not make the matter clear either way. And therefore, they neither worship him nor treat him with dishonor, but take up a neutral position, or rather a very miserable one with respect to him. So even in the second half of the 4th century, within Christianity, there is a variety of views about how to define the Holy Spirit. However, the Cappadocians do end up winning the day, and they are the architects, if you will, of the next big creed of 381 in Constantinople. They're very influential in that document. So we have several innovations, though. I don't want to get away from this. We have several innovations. The first was the homoousios. That was an innovation in the year 325, and that was suggested by a non-Christian intellectual named Constantine. Okay. Then the second innovation is understanding that the Spirit is of equal worship and honor as the Father and the Son. 
That's a new innovation. You don't see people talking like that before then. And then the third is we have this concept of hypostasis or hypostases in usia. A hypostasis is uh, roughly equivalent to the English word person. Although I think a philosopher might get mad at me for simplifying it that much. But I'm just going to go with it. So the idea of three persons in one substance, that is also language we start to see in the second half of the 4th century, specifically with these Cappadocian theologians. In the year 380, Emperor Theodosius made Trinitarian Christianity the state religion. And in 381, he had a council in Constantinople. Now this that I'm going to read to you is the Constantinopolitan Creed of 381. I had already read to you a Constantinopolitan Creed of 360, and it was subordinationist. This one, though, is billed as one of the seven ecumenical councils of the church. But even worse than Nicaea, it had no representatives of the West. It was 100% bishops from the East, and therefore it's not ecumenical, once again. <laughs> it was attended by 150 bishops, and it was not considered definitive in its own time. People in the West didn't even hear about it. They're like, what's that? We don't even know what that is. And ultimately, this creed of 381 was seized upon, if I could say it that way, as a cause for division between the Eastern and Western churches when the official split happened between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. It was over this creed, at least in part. I don't want to put too much on it. All right, so what does the creed say? It goes, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, boom, of one substance with the Father. So I guess the church is going to be homoousion after all. Of one substance with the Father, through whom all things came into existence, who because of us men and our salvation came down from the heavens and was incarnate, from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man. Then I'm going to skip ahead to the interesting part about the Holy Spirit. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord... So the old creed just said, and in the Holy Spirit. This one says, and in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and life giver who proceeds from the Father. There's all kinds of conversation about procession and what that means. Who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is together worshipped, together glorified, who spoke through the prophets, and it goes on to talk about some other components again after that. So what we can see here is, I mean, it's not quite the Trinity as we would describe it today, but it's really close. And uh, so I, I think it's close enough that we could just say, all right, we have a full-blown Trinitarian creed. It's not quite the way anyone today would put it, let's be honest. There's no three persons in one essence, you know, and it's not so evenly described, but it's, it's close enough, I think. Canon 1, a lot of times when you have a council, the council issues canons, and canons are rulings. They're like canon law, rulings. So canon 1 of the Council of Constantinople of 381, presided over by Emperor Theodosius I, said that all Anomians, Arians, Numatomachoi, and Sibelians and Photenians are now considered anathematized. So let me go, and there were some others too, but I just want to mention these. Anomians, these are people that believe the Son and the Father are unlike each other. They're now anathema. They're not allowed to go to church. If you're found out to be one of that group, you're not allowed to come anymore. You're not allowed to participate in communion. If you're an Arian, this other category, Numatomachoi, this is a really interesting category. It's a new heresy. How exciting. Why do we have a new heresy? Because we have an innovation within the doctrine of the church. So there are going to be people that say, I'm not going to do that. Every time you propose a change, I don't care if you're changing the carpet in your house, there's always somebody that's going to say, I don't like it, right? Uh, it just seems that way, at least. So these spirit fighters were people that could even believe in homoousios. They could have even believed in the same substance, but they just didn't agree with the Holy Spirit being elevated to the same rank as the Father and the Son. 
So now they're going to be kicked out of the church. And then the Photinians, I just mentioned them because we're going to talk about them next time. But they were relevant, although I'm not covering them in this session. We'll just put a pin in that. All right, so Theodosius I, let me tell you about this guy as we just kind of wind things down here. Theodosius I reigned from 379 to 395. He began reducing religious freedom for non-Trinitarian Christians, pagans, and Jews. As you remember, when we looked at Constantine, Constantine had first issued his Edict of Milan, gave toleration to all religions. He favored Christianity, but he tolerated all religions. That was the beginning of the shift. At the end of the shift, we're tolerating not all religions, not even all Christians, just one branch of Christianity, the branch of Christianity that the emperor says, and that is the branch known as the Nicenes or the Homoousians. So Theodosius... um, ordered that his procurators, the governors, would not allow these kinds of Christians to meet in their territories. So if you didn't agree with the Trinity definition of 381, you couldn't have church. And if your governor was discovered allowing you to have church, he would be fined 10 pounds of gold or sent into exile. So now there's motivation, there's teeth. It's not just like, oh, you're you're all anathema, it's a spiritual crime to be, you know, uh, subordinatious. No, no, no. Now it's legal. Now you have the governor on the lookout because if somebody reports that such such and such a city, there is this congregation that is non-Trinitarian, now you're going to get fined. Stuff starts to really come down as far as limitations. He also outlawed the Jews from celebrating Purim and... He prohibited marriage between Christians and Jews. He said, that's not going to happen anymore. In 384, he removed the altar of victory from the Senate in Rome. This is a pagan altar used to make sacrifices before they had official meetings. It had been there for a thousand years or whatever. It had been there forever. And uh, in 384, Theodosius I says, not not in my empire. This This is a Catholic Christian empire, and it's going to be done my way. He outlawed pagan sacrifices, and during his uh, reign, there was widespread looting, vandalism, and destruction of pagan temples by Christians. He punished any Christians who celebrated Easter on a weekday rather than on a Sunday, which was an old controversy called the Cordo de Simeon controversy. I did not get into it with you, but... There were some Christians that wanted to celebrate on the day, like the Jews celebrated on the day, whereas Christians celebrate on the Sunday closest to the day of the Jewish calendar. We don't need to get all into it. But the point is, he's cracking down. He's saying, no, you have to, we all, we're all going to do it this way, and that's the way it's going to be. And uh, after his death, his sons and his grandsons continued his policies and added to them. In 399, all country temples were destroyed. Initially, it was city now even the country temples. In 408, only Catholic Christians could serve in the palace. So if you had somebody that was a subordinationist or non-Trinitarian, they are no longer going to be allowed access to the emperor. In 415, pagans were banned from the military. So you had to be a Christian, not just any Christian, a Catholic Christian to be in the military, which essentially completes the Constantinian shift, going from no Christians in the military or very few, and they're kind of embarrassed about it, to in order to be in the military, you have to be a Christian in the year 415. Let's summarize a little bit. Joseph Lynch writes, When modern readers are introduced to the theological debates of the 4th and 5th centuries, they are sometimes shocked by the atmosphere in which they took place. I know I was. Those debates were not carried on by calm scholars sitting in their manuscript line studies. From one perspective, the story is one of misunderstandings, vicious personal attacks, distortions, violence, bribes, mutual excommunication, intervention by emperors, and the deposition and exile of bishops and others who lost in the struggle. From another perspective, the story is one of 
theological creativity that has shaped Christian beliefs for about 15 centuries. Now look, I know some people would disagree with me about this, but I'm what's called a restorationist. I'm looking to restore Christianity to the way that it was done by the apostles and then find, figure out how to live that today. That's, that's, that's the game I'm playing. Uh, that's what I think, I, that's what I think of, the goal is of Christian scholarship, is to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. To have theological creativity, to me, was just like the worst thing you could say about somebody. It's, it's saying you invented new ways and new beliefs that weren't there in the Bible. Lynch is very comfortable saying that, kind of like as a compliment, I guess. And that's indeed what happened. There was theological creativity that set the mold that Christianity would have to uphold for the next 15 centuries. Well, we don't know how many centuries all in. For more about this time period, I recommend The Search for the Christian Doctrine of God by R.P.C. Hansen. It's very technical, very thick, but very thorough and very high quality. Another book that, and I mentioned that one before, but another book that I think is very good is the Charles Freeman book called AD 381. Much easier to read, and it really does focus on the shifts that occur in the later half of the 4th century. I mean, it covers a fair amount, but it's more focused on heretics, pagans, and the dawn of the monotheistic state. And of course, there's like so much more that I didn't cover. I just kind of went over the, you know, the basics with you, but there's much more. Let's review. At the Council of Nicaea in 325, Emperor Constantine introduced the theologically problematic word homoousios into the controversy over the son's origin and substance. The original Nicene Creed did not mention three persons in one God, nor did it define the Holy Spirit. The theological civil war that Nicaea caused raged on for another 56 years, at least, as council after council favored different positions. The three main parties in the battle were Homoousians, the Nicenes, Enomians, the Arians, and the Homoians, or Semi-Arians. Athanasius of Alexandria led the charge for the Homoousians, attacking his theological enemies with vicious words, malicious politicking, and physical violence. Successive emperors supported different theological factions throughout the 4th century, swinging imperial favor back and forth. Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nyssa, and Gregory of Nazianzus, the three Cappadocians, developed a full-blown Trinity theory, including the Holy Spirit as worthy of equal worship and honor. Although it was not ecumenical nor well attended, the 381 Council of Constantinople defined the doctrine of the Trinity that many are familiar with today. Emperor Theodosius enforced the Constantinopolitan Creed for all Catholic Christians in his domain, limiting religious freedom for non-Trinitarians, pagans, and Jews. And finally, Theodosius completed the Constantinian shift by officially merging one brand of Christianity with the state. Now, I did want to mention to you that the the creed of Constantinople, I think maybe it's just too hard to say the word Constantinopolitan creed. So most people today, if they mention to you the Nicene Creed or the Creed of Nicaea, they're probably not going to actually quote the Nicene Creed of 325. They're probably quoting the Creed of Constantinople of 381. It's just a weird thing that happened in history that, You know, they're pointing at this, but they're really reading this over here. So just a little clarification there. In our next session, we'll look at another voice not represented in this debate, the dynamic Menarchians. In particular, we'll consider Paul of Samosata and Photinus of Sirmium as we continue in our journey through early church history. Well, that brings this session to a close. What'd you think? Come on over to restitudio.org and leave a comment on episode 495, Trinity Controversy in the 4th Century. Would love to hear your thoughts. On YouTube, a user named Proselyte of Yah wrote in on last week's episode, which was on Arius and Alexander of Alexandria, and commented about origin. I'd like to read out his comment here. 
Another point about Origen is that it's easy to see why both Arians and Athanasians laid claim to him, as Origen, while saying Jesus was an eternal hypostasis of God, also said, We believe, however, that nothing is uncreated but the Father, and said those who say Jesus is equal to the Father are impious, and those claiming Jesus was the highest God himself were incautious and not held with by Origen. He goes on to quote a couple more sayings about Origen, and then he writes, Origen explains his philosophy that all other beings are divine by partaking in God's divinity as images of images. That being God is the source of all things, including the sun, as the original archetypical image of which all other images are thereafter from. It seems to me his views are very much in line with several church fathers before him, like Tertullian, Justin, who I describe as semi-Arian. Well, that's an interesting point you make about Origen, and it is interesting that he uh, that both Alexandrians, Arius and Alexander, and Ath- and if we throw in Athanasius and many, many others, to be honest, all consider themselves Originists. And all drew upon Origen's writings. One of the problems, though, we have with Origen's writings is that his main theological textbook called De Principis, or Periarchon in the Greek, which translates to On First Principles, this systematic theology was not preserved, at least not much of it, in the Greek language in which it was originally written and survives only as a translation by Rufinus, who bowderlized it and edited it so that it conformed with orthodoxy in his day, which was on the other side of the Trinitarian controversy. So a lot of what Origen could have said, uh, at least in, uh, in, in his On First Principles, he didn't actually say um, in support of that idea. But it's interesting that, that Rufinus would even do that. Why do that? Well, because everybody knows Origen is a first-rate thinker, and so you want to claim him as being on your side. And as the commenter on the YouTube video I just read has quotes from the Gospel of, from Origen's commentary on the Gospel of John and his book Contra Kelsum or Against Kelsus, and those books were not tampered with, and so we get a little more honesty. But so far as I could tell, Origen's theory did hold to a version of eternal generation, a doctrine that's become controversial again in our time. Even uh, William Lane Craig has denied it. And Origen seems to have thought that at the same time, the Son is eternal and begotten. And how that works out is pretty darn complicated. Also, as a result of the fact that he's begotten, and this is something that Alexander himself believed, as well as Arius, pretty much everybody, Uh, up until the middle of the 4th century, that because of the difference in origin, the father being unbegotten and son being begotten, that the father was, at least in some sense, superior to the son. And so the whole idea of co-equality really does need to wait until a little bit later into the 4th century, as we saw in this episode, to fully develop. As far as whether or not Tertullian and Justin are on board with Origen, I'd say that there they, are definitely some significant differences in their models of God. Uh, Justin, I think, is just coming from a classic Greco-Roman perspective of there being many gods in the universe, and Jesus is the highest God next to the Father, who is, of course, way above everyone else as the uncreated one. Jesus is another God, but he is not the same God as the Father. Whereas Tertullian gets a little bit more technical in his description of God. Tertullian says that the stuff of which God is comprised, because they believe that God was made of some sort of substance, some sort of matter, very fine matter that was of the highest quality, uh, that that matter or stuff of which God is made he contributed a portion of to make the sun or to to generate the sun, if we want to use that term if we're uncomfortable with the word make. So the sun is of the same substance of the Father, but it's a partial substance of the Father. So that later becomes the heresy of partialism. But, but in the end, for Tertullian, the Father still is the one supreme God who is unoriginated and superior to 
even the Son of God. So definitely some interesting theories among these different early church theologians. And sadly, there wouldn't be any kind of investigation allowed on the subject after Theodosius outlaws anything other than the Cappadocian version of the Trinity in the year 381. Uh, But as it turns out, ladies and gentlemen, the story does not end here. Uh, Next time, we're going to look at uh, some of the biblical Unitarian trailblazers, Paul of Samosata and Photinus. And and then in subsequent episodes, eventually we'll get back to looking at the subject of Christology in the 5th century. And you would not, I'm telling you, you would not believe the chaos, the the conflict, and the battles waged in the 5th and even 6th centuries over the dual natures of Christ. Uh, So you have to stay tuned for that because that's a really juicy story. It makes the 4th century look like just a walk in the park, to be honest. So stay tuned for that. If you'd like to support Restitutio, you can do that on our website, restitutio.org. That's it for this week. We'll catch you next week. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.